I'm going to have to read a little bit tonight. It's been uh, challenging the second week into semester and trying to get everything ready, uh, multiple talks and, and all that. Um, but I'm particularly happy uh, to be here and to be able to introduce some of our work tonight. Um, I'm also happy to see that we've lured a few people in from industry. Welcome. Um, and I'm going to speak for around about 40 minutes, uh, but there'll be a lot of slides. Uh, so I hope you find that interesting. And I'm going to use my time to talk about some of our research projects, uh, the history of prefabrication, and to introduce some of the findings and challenges from our research projects. Uh, but before I go too much further, I'd just like to acknowledge the research team that I work with who are not here tonight, uh, but who have produced some of the work that you'll see. Um, also, before I get going, I might just expand a little bit on Leanne's introduction and say that I joined uh, the University of Sydney only in January this year. And um, uh, although I came from Queensland, the University of Queensland, which explains a lot of the partnerships you'll see in our industry projects, uh, I spent the bulk of my adult life um, in Germany, in Berlin to be specific. Um, and this actually has some bearing on the kind of work that I do. Um, Berlin, for those of you who know it, is a fantastic and fun place to live. Uh, it's actually a terrible place to try and work and actually build things and get stuff done because there's so much fun to be had. Um, so one of the things that I really enjoyed about returning to Australia was to have the opportunity to work as a teacher, as a researcher and as a designer. Um, it's something that I, uh, I feel fairly passionate about. So as Leanne also mentioned, um, I direct the research lab here, the Innovation and in Applied Design Lab. And within the lab, we work directly with industry, uh, also in collaboration with other researchers on live projects. And by applied design, I mean to make a distinction between purely speculative or experimental design and the projects we do, which take their cues from problems in industry and indeed uh, some of the everyday concerns of our partners. So as you may have noticed, many of the projects underway um, or about to begin in the lab are concerned with prefab and modular building problems. Uh, there are also other projects in the lab that are in development, but tonight we'll just focus on prefab. Um, and I'll just start by quickly outlining what those projects are. Uh, this project we affectionately call LP13 focuses on one and two storey detached housing. Um, our main industry partners uh, for those projects are Happy House and Hutchinson Builders. AP14 uh, looks at the problem of medium rise modular housing in the three to four storey range. <coughs> I won't bore you too much with all of these lists, but <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> these are our industry partners. Um, it's a very wide multidisciplinary team, as you can see. And similarly on AP14, uh, though slightly different because it's a little bit more focused on implementation rather than uh, research. The most recent project, which I had caused to introduce last week at an event put on here by Prefab Oz, uh, one of the peak bodies in Australia for the promotion of uh, prefabricated and modular building, um, is the Industrial Transformation Training Centre for the Advanced Manufacturing of Prefabricated Housing. I'm pretty sure they'll come up with an acronym soon to make sure that I don't have to say that again. Um, and that program's been specifically devised uh, to educate the next generation of researchers at the PhD and postdoctoral levels uh, to try to take the Australian industry to the next level uh, and give the country a competitive advantage. Uh, the PhDs and po postdocs in this program will be required to spend at least one year of their research term embedded in the in within uh, the businesses of the industry partners that we work with. So again, another list, I promise the last. A really broad multidisciplinary team. The University of Sydney is one of four research institutions involved in the bid. University of Melbourne is lead institution. Uh, and we also work with Curtin University and Monash University. Uh, here at the University of Sydney, our team includes Professor Kim Rasmussen and Associate Professor Gianluca Ranzi from Civil Engineering, and Dr. Francesco Fiorito and myself from uh, the faculty here. So the industry partners we'll work with on that project are pre-built in Melbourne and also with Richard Kirk Architects in Brisbane. 
And as part of our bid, we'll recruit three PhDs and one postdoctoral fellow. For, for those of you who are interested, keep an eye open for those uh, uh, advertisements. So what's the thinking behind the federal government's policy uh, in this area um, within which the ITTC will sit? There's that acronym. Well, clearly there's a push by the government to invest in the next generation of manufacturing technique and technology in light of the departure of the auto uh, manufacturing industry. Within these areas, there's great interest in transforming aspects of the construction industry towards an advanced manufacturing future, as they call it. Now, while I'm very uh, supportive of all of these efforts, I still think we're at the early stages uh, of this and seeing how this new economy will actually play out as you'll see tonight, I've got some thoughts about this and I'll come back to them sporadically throughout the talk. But perhaps I can just start by turning back towards our research in this area and talk you through some of the problems we've encountered. There's that list again. Happy House is a Brisbane-based but nationally operated company which specialises in architect design prefabricated housing. Unlike other companies who offer a standard one-style fits-all design, Happy House offers a range of designs by Australian architects who are renowned uh, as leaning uh, residential designers. Toby Lewis is the founder of Happy, Laus, uh, Happy, Laus, Happy House and he contacted me in 2012 to put together a research project that could take Happy House to the next level. As I remember, Toby's message was very simple. We don't know what we don't know, which is perhaps the best brief any research team could get. It's probably interesting in the context of our research to understand why Toby started Happy House. He had tried to build his own home and as a property developer, even Toby wasn't immune to the problems that all professions trying to build new houses or extensions in Australia face. The budget blew out, it took 18 months to get planning approvals, there were problems on site, etc, etc. Coincidentally, in 2012, I was building two, or at least trying to. This is not the building. Uh, I was in the midst of completing a large house extension in Brisbane. I had had the same problems, budget blowout, time delays, variations galore, builder gone AWOL, and me holding the can with the client, uh, which, and you guessed it, was my mother-in-law. So uh, I had to do that one, I'm afraid. All through this experience, uh, there was an idea running through my mind, and I think it's an idea that's gone through Toby's mind and many other people that are involved in this industry, and that is that there must be a better way to do this. Who can afford the risks associated with building these days, and indeed who can afford to build houses at all? In Brisbane, many architect design houses and extensions are well over $3,000 per square metre, and I've heard in inner city Sydney, it's at least double that. At some point, the shocking realisation as an architect sets in that you'll never be able to live in an architect design house. That's a sad day. <laughs> Perhaps. Thinking more about my profession and the discipline, who are we actually building for? And what indeed is the role of design in housing today? And I know that's a question that, that fascinates a lot of my colleagues here at the University of Sydney. In my opinion, Providing accessibility to well-designed, high-quality, dignified housing is one of the most fundamental challenges facing architects today. But I do think we have to take stock and note that with few notable exceptions, and there are exceptions, that as a profession we haven't had much of an impact on this challenge. Depending on who you ask, ask architects design around 2-3% to of new homes in Australia. This figure is slightly higher when we move to multi-residential building, but it's still a fairly damning statistic. Happy House sits between these poles and it's the company's objective not to match quality and price of existing suburban volume housing but to provide an alternative with improved quality at a comparable price point. The plans of the Happy Houses are more efficient and so the overall price comes down. You're not paying for a bloated though cheap house. Happy House has shown us one of the ways that this situation can be improved. And as Toby pointed out from the beginning, one of Happy House's obje objectives was to make quality designed homes accessible to a wider segment of the housing market, effectively a democratisation of design as he termed it. Perhaps the second problem is reputation, and I touched on this a little bit outside at the book launch. 
Prefab uh, is historically associated with temporary low quality serial, serial and identical buildings and mainly because of its use in schools, hospitals, military and mining accommodation as you saw outside. Now Happy House have obviously tried to combat this by using striking designs and this is a success that was confirmed in the survey data we collected uh, at the beginning of the project which demonstrated that there was a high quality and a variety of style and, and high customer satisfaction. The housing construction industry is another problem because it's very resistant to change. So how to innovate when the building block of an Australian industry, uh, and, I, and I use this term with tongue in cheek, guys in utes who uh, have incredibly low overheads and are incredibly flexible into the bargain. So as you've seen, uh, there's broad faith from the government that transforming the construction industry towards a manufacturing industry will hold great benefits for the industry itself and end users alike. So moving back again to our research project, I thought it'd be useful to point out the way that we do the research. As you've seen, we have a very, very broad team. Um, and with all of the prof professions involved uh, in this project, we've got the potential to not only research and develop new design solutions, but also to build new housing prototypes. So the research obviously has to be broad too. And you learn very quickly that you can't do this research on your own. It is indeed a team sport. And to find the answers that we need, we need to look at a range of areas and cast the net widely. And obviously the goal, as demonstrated in that uh, diagram up on the screen, is to lead towards an integration and optimization of all of those areas. So in the spirit of going backwards and deeper and deeper into the research, I'd now like to focus on some of the things we've learned. As a term, prefabrication has uh, become a topic for closer scrutiny in recent times. As I mentioned, rightly or wrongly, it's the dongers and demountables that have come to characterise prefab housing and building in Australia. But this is changing, as I've shown. But the problems with the terminology in this area also arise because of the ubiquity of prefab in 20th century architecture culture. In an article from 2013, a colleague, Chris Knapp, provocatively called for an end of prefabrication, largely because he felt, and I quote, there's not another word in the current lexicon of architecture that more erroneously asserts positive change, end quote. But Knapp's not alone in thinking that the problems that have coalesced around prefabrication have done so because of problems of its definition, and indeed the hubris associated with architect-led forays in the field. Where it is or once was common to refer to buildings assembled off-site as prefabricated, this definition does not take into account that in contemporary building, the overwhelming majority of building components are fabricated off-site and merely assembled in situ. A large portion of the Australian housing construction has been and continues to be an industry of assembly and not an artisan, craft-based industry of bespoke, climatically and regionally adapted building. A fitting historical example of this phenomenon is the Queenslander, which was developed as a kit of parts by the coastal sawmills and sold by catalogue order and transported around the state by ship or rail and used indiscriminately in arid, tropical, subtropical and temperate climates. So in this same manner, the Australian contemporary project home industry could equally, equally be regarded as an industry heavily reliant on prefabrication. So there are a variety of terms that have emerged uh, over recent years, over the past century indeed, to explain the differences and the confusion around prefabrication. Modular systems kit or packaged homes tend to point to the flexible nature of prefabrication. Off-site or indoor construction refers to how and where the components are made. Pre-made and pre-built are simple synonyms for prefabrication. Portable, mobile and transportable housing highlight the movable nature of these buildings. And finally, manufactured, factory built and mass produced are all references to the scale of and level of industrialization involved. Now, while these terms might be useful as descriptors, they are perhaps less useful in understanding the nature of the problems and the historical barriers faced by prefabricated housing. The ever growing list of terms and concept focus on the differences in technique, but not on the commonalities of intention. 
In essence, they all strive to deliver the core advantages of prefabrication, which have, in fact, changed very little over the past two centuries. These are geared around achieving benefits in cost, time and quality, and offering particular solutions for remote or problematic sites, sites where materials or skills are in short supply. The simple benefits, these simple benefits offered by prefabrication explain the early interest in prefabricated housing solutions in the colonial pe period. Equally for mining accommodation both in the 19th and 21st centuries and its attendant dongers. And as Colin Davies has pointed out in his excellent book, The Prefabricated Home of 2005, in the hands of architects, the fundamental conditions which have made prefabrication of interest are often overlooked. And debates around terminology, I think, have served as a distraction. So when we come to the area of prefab and modular construction, I think one of the most fundamental things we had to learn in our research group was that prefabrication is not new. Now this sounds clearly very simple, but there is a ubiquity associated with prefabrication in architectural culture, and there is a strong cyclical interest in the area. And I guess what's curious here is that there's a kind of amnesia at play and a real lack of historical knowledge about what happened last time. In working in the area over the past few years, I've found that many companies have very little or no knowledge of previous attempts to industrialise building through prefabricated and modular construction methodologies, at least beyond living memory. So just to make a little game of it, here's a quote from a well-known architect describing a problem of housing. See if you can guess from when. The reason for the malaise in housing is the fact that the public is always at a disadvantage, whether it builds with an entrepreneur or with an architect. The entrepreneur is justly avoided by many because he unscrup unscrupulously hurries projects through in order to save costs and because he does damage to his client by saving materials and wages in order to increase his own profit. The architect, on the other hand, who provides designs, is only interested in raising the cost of a job since final cost determines his fee, and that's the CPD component for tonight taken care of. In both cases, the client is the sufferer. His ideal is the artist architect who sacrifices all to aesthetic aims and thereby does economic damage to himself. Pardon the uh, gendered language. 1946. Well done, 1909. That was Walter Gropius, and I think it might be difficult to find uh, a more succinct definition of the problem. Gropius made these observations in a pitch to Emil Rattenau, the president of the German industrial giant AEG, as part of a proposal for a new version of industrialised housing that was based on flexible standardisation and of the company, Gropius wrote, the new company intends to offer its clients not only inexpensive, well-built and practical houses, and in addition, a guarantee of good taste, but also to take into consideration individual wishes without sacrificing them to the principle of industrial consistency. Now, not that you probably need it. Here's another quote closer to our time and to our place. If the housing industry were to embrace modern factory methods with even half the enthusiasm of the car industry, in no time it would be producing standardised components or space enclosures of some kind which could be assembled in various ways to suit the needs of each buyer, gradually the family itself would become the designer of its own pattern of standardised units, changing them about if necessary as the pattern of the family life developed. 1946? 1960, that was Robin Boyd. As you can probably guess by now, it didn't actually happen in Australia. The project home builders are still the cheapest option on the market today. To the casual observer, most of the mainstream housing industry has little regard for architect design houses or highly industrialised processes. Now, as everyone here will know, at least from within this building, there's a lot of excitement at the moment around the potential uh, in the intersection between computational design tools and digital and automated fabrication technologies, which undoubtedly will ultimately have a huge impact on the way we think about design and building in the future. The younger generation of designers and researchers is already steeped in this technology and the promise it holds, but with my historian glasses on for just a little bit longer, I have to admit that I'm a more, more than a little bit suspicious about some of the technologically inspired enthusiasms in this book 
uh, among others. So mass customization is the buzzword here, and I'd like to get into this a little uh, deeper with the uh, with uh, recourse to some slides provided to me by Duncan Maxwell. Historically, the more prefabrication there is, the less uh, design flexibility there is. And here's the promise in the follow-up slide of what mass customization should be able to deliver. More prefabrication and the benefits it brings, but with more design flexibility. This mood, as it were, around the promise of mass customization is perhaps best summed up by Alastair Parvin in talking about his clever WikiHow project in a TED talk in 2013. I'm just going to play a little movie. A 3D printer that was open source, the parts for which could be made on another 3D printer. Or the same idea here, which is for a CNC machine, which is like a large printer that can cut sheets of plywood. What these technologies are doing is radically lowering the thresholds of time and cost and skill. They're challenging the idea that if you want something to be affordable, it's got to be one size fits all. And they're distributing massively really complex manufacturing capabilities. We're moving into this future where the factory is everywhere. And increasingly, that means that the design team is every one. That really is an industrial revolution. And we were fascinated by what that might mean for architecture. So about a year and a half ago, we started working on a project called WikiHouse. And WikiHouse is an open source construction system. And the idea is to make it possible for anyone to go online, access a freely shared library of 3D models, which they can download and adapt in, at the moment, SketchUp, because it's free and it's easy to use. And almost at the click of a switch, they can generate a set of cutting files, which allow them, in effect, to print out the parts from a house using a CNC machine and a standard sheet material like plywood. And the parts are all numbered. And basically, what you end up with is a really big IKEA kit. <laughs> and it goes together without any bolts. It uses wedge and peg connections. And even the mallets to make it can be provided on the cutting sheets as well. And a team of about two or three people working together can build this. They don't need any traditional construction skills. They don't need a huge array of power tools or anything like that. And they can build a small house of about this size in about a day. And <laughs> So, what do we learn? The factory is everywhere. Everyone is a designer. This will revolutionize design, making architecture accessible to the 99%, and you can even make the mallet out of the same sheet. Parvin's not wrong to think that there is a revolution afoot. Um, and while I think the project that he does is very laudable, and it's refreshing to hear an architect today talk on the world stage about accessibility, equity, and compassion, Yet, as we've seen, Alastair is not alone in thinking that technology and industry married with the capacity of designers will solve the entrenched problems of housing. Clearly, Parvin's claim echo those of Boyd some 55 years ago and Gropius', Gropius ideas uh, from a further 51 years before that. These ideas are not new. They are not tied to a particular technology or technique, but they do have uh, the quality of a kind of recurring dream, a promised land for architecture. Prefabrication in the hands of architects is prone to hubris and often taken up as a rhetorical or ideological position. Prefabrication, I believe, is a means to an end. But in some cases, you could be forgiven for thinking that prefabrication is an end in and of itself. And this is wrong thinking, in my view, where ends and means are freely reversed. And it's a problem I'll return to again later. So in our research projects, I emphasize emphasize that we need to move beyond this and to approach these problems with a, a fuller awareness not only of the past but also of the present. As I mentioned, prefab housing is something of a promised land in architecture. Every generation approaches the problems anew but with a kind of amnesia. Perhaps that's why one of the best books in the area by Gilbert Herbert is titled The Dream of the Factory Made House. In the 20th century, it seems that many architects hold on to the dream, yet they reinvent it from scratch. I want to take a few minutes now 
to look at one of the most interesting and promising examples of this kind of thinking that ties in nicely with the entrepreneur theme of the lecture series this semester. There's a very strong stream of inventor, architect, prefab design uh, entrepreneurs, which I won't have time to explore tonight. Uh, but this project that we're about to look at is perhaps one on the more sober end of the scale. It's Walter Gropius and Conrad Buxman's work on the General Panel Company in the United States in the 1940s, and its factory-built outcome, The Packaged Home. As we've heard, Gropius had been fascinated by the problems of industrialised buildings since 1909, and on this project he teamed up with another German émigré architect, the lesser-known Conrad Buxman, both of whom were resident in the USA. From 1941 to 1945, they collaborated on developing a system of standardised panels that could be fixed with a patented wedge and later hook system. Needless to say, the panels could be flexibly configured. This project had some of the best preconditions of any 20th century prefabricated housing. A highly talented and influential team, large amounts of private, private and public funding, and a post-war housing boom that favoured mass prefabricated housing as it did here in Australia. Yet this project ultimately came to nothing and the question uh, needs to be asked, why? They had great design, excellent team, money and market. Well, if you can understand this diagram, then you'll know why. But uh, over the next minute or so, hopefully we can unpack some of this. Ultimately, Herbert finds that the packaged home did not fail for any one reason but many reasons, and often reasons compounded. Among them, the model for the general panel company was the car industry. But Herbert found that the analogy was false because there was no way for the company to recoup their debts from a multi-year R&D project by ramping up production because they needed to compete from day one with the mainstream housing market that already offered low prices. This was not the case for the auto manufacturing industry. According to Herbert, this resulted in what he termed the Henry Ford syndrome, which reoccurred time and time again throughout the 20th century. Timing. It took too long to develop the system. By 1946, the company had not sold a single house, and by the time it got to market, the subventions had collapsed and the war was over. By 1950, the company went bust. Now, although Waxman uh, is regarded as a maverick genius, on the general, pan general panel project, the architects, and principally Waxman, dithered with creating the perfect system, wasting precious time, goodwill, and missing the market that was less, interest in perfect less interested in perfect details than in cost and seeming individuality. The product had an overdetermined uh, technological approach that was not integrated with policy and regulation, and used a closed construction methodology that did not allow for easy integration with existing skill bases or traditions in building. And this is again a point that's very important to uh, note in our work and I'll come back to it. Finally and relatively unspectacularly, the company suffered a collapse in its financing and that was the uh, nail in the coffin. So there are important lessons to be learned from Gropius and Buxman's effort, efforts. Foremost among these is the place of innovation. Let's start from the basic principles I introduced above in our discussion of the terminology. Why is prefabricated housing of interest at all? As I said, they haven't changed much over the last 200 years. Prefab offers time, cost and quality benefits and it also offers particular solutions for remote or problematic sites where materials and skills are in short supply. Hence the interest in colonial solutions. In thinking more about the problem of innovation, it's useful to distinguish it from invention. The difference between invention and innovation, in my view, are the markers of uptake and ex uh, acceptance. So if you grant me this, it's clear that much of the 20th century architect design prefab housing is rich in invention, new processes, technology materials, etc., but less so in innovation. We might ask, does innovation need to look like invention? Looking at the coffee table books on architecture, architect design prefab housing, the answer is a resounding yes. I tend to agree with my research partner at the University of Queensland, Jose Torero Cullen, who summarises the problem thus. There's real innovation, and then of course there's no innovation because sometimes you just can't make it. And then there's also a kind of innovation that's no innovation but that's made to look as though it's innovative. 
And this is what I see when I look at the Domaxian house of the 20s, the futuristic bubbles of the 60s, and to a much lesser degree, the well-meaning attempts of Wiki House. All very rich in invention, but with very little uptake. Let's take Parvin's gimmicky plywood mallet. Innovation is not found in reinventing a mallet made of plywood. Innovation, at least the kind required to rehouse the poor, as Parvin himself suggests, is in making the housing cheap, transportable and easy to erect, and using skills and materials at hand. Presumably, the impoverished or the disaster struck of the world would do better to get a real hammer and some nails in the post than a CNC machine, which in the examples I've seen mysteriously works best in the controlled environments of universities, needs electricity and can only run on standardised advanced materials such as plywood. It is very unfair of me to single out Parvin, but he is representative of a broader sentiment that prefab housing has a unique opportunity to position itself as a flagship for the new production and manufacturing approaches where digital and automated fabrication technologies are key. There's a sense that these new technologies will help architects painlessly bypass the mass production of the packaged house or Boyd's auto industry inspired call, it, call to arms or the various changes that the auto industry itself uh, has undergone as it developed from a craft based to an automated lean production system. As I mentioned at the beginning, there is a hope that manufactured housing can take up the place of the now departed car manufacturing. As architects, we are sympathetic to this movement because as Parvin states, there is a sense that these new technologies will change the rules of industry itself and give architects back an agency in building that they have progressively lost, essentially putting architects back into the driver's seat, pun fully intended. And while I think he's right, I do disagree with the way he is suggesting that this might happen. So I've spent a lot of time tonight shadowboxing, uh, but without really alluding to what we've done and how we've done it and what we'd all like to do in the future in our research projects. So hopefully I can come back to that now a little. If there's a thread that's been running through our early work and that's recently surfaced explicitly in our thinking, it can probably be best described by the maxim, maxim process, not product. I'd like to unpack this a little more with recourse to some of our research travel. A few weeks ago, I had the pleasure to talk and walk around the Capsis factory in the Brooklyn Navy Yards with Robbie Kuhlman, who is a long-standing expert on prefab and modular building in the USA. I asked Robbie how they did this and how they did that, and he said, well, well, yes, you could do it this way or you could do it that way. It depends, he said. Last year at this time, Marty Bignall and myself took part in a study tour of Japan's leading prefab housing manufacturers. I could gladly give a whole lecture talking about the lessons we learned there, but I'll just focus on one aspect of the construction methodologies. Broadly speaking, there are two approaches in Japanese prefab. Volumetric solutions, which are shipped as modules like these ones, and a componentized or flat pack solution. As we noticed at the time, there was really no readily apparent causality between the chosen methodology and the final outcome. One has to go deeper to find out what the decision-making process is. One company will do a flat pack, one company will do a volumetric. The same company will do a fat, flat pack or volumetric, and the same company might decide to use steel frames, but they'll also use timber if the market demands it. Recently, Marty started to get interested in this loose fit problem and he started to dig a little deeper into this in his PhD. But together, Robbie's It Depends and Marty's Loose Fit are both key insights into the area that we are researching in prefab and modular, or, or industrialised building, one might say, more generally. So this requires, this, this new approach, this process over product, requires a lot more research, but the immediate lessons are fairly simple, unfortunately, underscored by our initial broad research strategy and these lessons are that there is no silver bullet. Improvements and gains are likely to be made across a range of areas and not one area in isolation. So all of these areas. There's not one solution but a field of solutions. And that's what we've come to term design matrix and I'll come back to that a little bit later as well. There's not a one-size-fits-all approach but instead variety and responsiveness are the appropriate reactions. And while the product is important, it's only a snapshot of a wider process that underpins it. 
This process, we have learned, is dynamic, highly dependent and constantly evolving, even if that change is slow and incremental. And finally, as I pointed out earlier, prefab is a means and not an end. There will be times when it makes sense and there will be other times when it makes no sense. But it's the ends part of that equation which is the important part. So let's just take a little step to the side and, and illustrate a little bit more what I mean. If you look at the fashionable magazines, you'll see that they're all about the product, a kind of fetishized product that actually ends up having no bearing on the reasons prefab was pursued in the first place. Like these amazing houses which you could never afford and there's no ostensible reason about why they should have ever been prefabricated except that one could say they've been prefabricated. Similarly, look at the coffee table books where you could easily be forgiving for thinking that prefab is also a kind of ideal to be aspired to as an end in itself that has some kind of inherent value. Again, wrong thinking in my view. A friend told me of an ancient Chinese saying which springs to mind in this context. And I hope I've got this right. Adapt flexibly to changing circumstances, it says. Now, as any business person or entrepreneur indeed can tell you, this is perhaps the guiding rule. It's also been doubly useful in challenging, uh, useful and challenging in our research. Firstly, in terms of the research itself and finding out what direction to pursue and which areas we should go deep on. But also for us in working with our industry partners where, and unlike many research projects in the university context, we don't have a clear and unconstrained field to work in, but rather one which is subject to the messy contingencies of market, sales, new developments, technologies or materials, or even new partnerships that may emerge along the way. So I'd now like to take another pass at this process versus product problem at a little closer range. From the very beginning of our research, we've felt an unresistible or an ir irresistible pull towards the creation of a highly efficient and integrated process, which runs from sales right through to delivery and installation and could even include a feedback loop, uh, a post-occupancy feedback loop, the kind of continuous improvement, as the Japanese call it, Kaizen. The prefab and modular delivery framework is different to normal delivery models because of the large amount of upfront planning and development that it requires. The promise of prefab is that once this investment's been made, it can be repeated and will therefore gain in efficiency every time. So let me run quickly through some of the work that's been done by uh, our team in this area. Here from Marty, we've got a study of panel products showing different capabilities. Note that there's a matrix of different solutions towards different criteria. You might use one in one context and another in another. That caused us to start a partnership with Ubic and Polytech, two, uh, two, two manufacturers, to make new panels. The lab testing has just been completed for that. And here's some drawings about how that could be implemented. Duncan Maxwell has been researching briefing and programming processes of Happy House and also of other manufacturers and comparing them to see uh, what improvements we could make. Um, also as part of a de developing our thinking for a new range of buildings, Duncan's prepared this construction matrix that lays out a range of different options about what components could be uh, prefabricated, what components could be made on site and in essence trying to find a sweet spot in there somewhere for a particular solution. Robert Doe has recently worked on a process to determine thermal performance optimization for a range of standard modules that could be applied to any future range. And essentially Robert is applying an algorithm here to the placement of the modules uh, uh, towards uh, optimizing their performance in winter and summer. So here's just a couple of the ways that that, that could be done. Jonathan Nelson has done a study of modular logistics to determine where are the pressure points for delivery and even the size of the modules. How many modules should you have and how big should they be? He also developed a Revit workflow that could incorporate aspects of the integrated process I mentioned earlier, attempting to make a seam seamless digital space uh, within which the company's business can operate. Gerardo Soret Contero is doing a PhD in civil en engineering with us and he's aiming to create a methodology for a three-in-one integration of thermal, acoustic and fire performance, which is very exciting. And finally, 
Jodie Cummins and Kate Humphreys have done a series of studies for the multi-storey modular project to determine the various options and combinations of assembly methodologies with floor and wall build-ups. So here you can see a range of uh, site types, planning envelopes and different assembly methodologies, uh, different layouts for service cores within those assembly methodologies, and finally um, a range of options and permutations for wall and floor build-ups which have an implication on all of the above. You can see how all of these things are incredibly uh, related to one another. So in closing now, I'll just talk very briefly about the process that we've undergone in trying to design a new product from our emerging process, which involved our whole team. These were our targets, and it's a hypothetical product for a low-cost or lower-cost housing solution that can participate in the mass housing markets. It's quite standardised. The idea is that this will result in what we call a rule book, which is essentially a repository of our findings and essentially a document that could be handed over to a designer, any designer or builder, and from which new or improved products and indeed processes could be developed. And as you can see by some of these uh, constraints and parameters, um, they respond to constraints both real and perceived um, that actually exist out there in the marketplace. It's a simple but very flexible system that would allow for flat pack or volumetric methodologies. And here's some uh, better solutions um, that demonstrate uh, different construction methodologies, again, both volumetric and flat packed. Now, this project's only at the early stages of design and clearly it needs to be prototyped and tested and that's something that we'll hopefully get on to do uh, later in the project. So I hope I've whet your appetite for prefab and I also hope that I've shown that uh, while prefab is promising, it's also a promise that can be clouded by strange thinking, at times tradition and often despite many well-meaning efforts. We're only part way through our research, we're not even halfway through in fact, and it's not clear exactly what course the research will take. So far we keep generating more questions than answers and I think that's probably a good sign. But if we've learned anything so far, it's to be on the lookout for plywood mallets lurking in our own thinking and for the architectural inclination towards grandiose schemes. For a better awareness of the past and to be aware uh, or be, to be aware of a narrow focus on the potential of technology or design or a neglect of the conditions which make prefabrication of interest to the market in the first place. Thank you. <laughs>